think I could say them as well as he can. So, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I would like to, I would like to present Mr. Stephen Rambam. Am I talking into this or that? Hello? Can you hear this? Okay, great. Uh, my name is Steve Rambam, and as I was just reminded, I have had the great pleasure of speaking at every single hope since the very first one, which means that I have been speaking at hope conferences since before some of the people in this room were born, as frightening a thought as that is. And I will try not to uh, come off as a uh, crotchety old semi-hacker. Uh, I've also been giving this talk since 97. Uh, in 97, Emmanuel came to me and said, uh, we really would like a different point of view. We'd like the investigator's point of view. And I gave it a lot of thought and uh, surveyed my colleagues, all of whom essentially said, don't do it, don't go. These people are criminals, they're miscreants, uh, they, they are people, they are, they are on the other side of the, uh, of the aisle, so to speak. And having had been to the Hope in 94, I knew quite well that wasn't true. Except maybe for the guy in disguise in the front row. There's a guy, you can't see this, but there's a guy sitting here wearing, stand up. Stand up, uh, don't be shy. He's wearing a Groucho Marx nose and glasses, <laughs> sitting in the front row. So except for him. That, yeah, that's right. It may not be a disguise. So I spoke in 97, and it was wonderful. And as I've since discovered, there is a real similarity between myself and my colleagues and the people who come to the HOPE conferences. You are essentially very, very aggressive investigators. Uh, you want to get down to the root level in cyberspace, and I want to get down, I want to get root in meat space. And there's not a whole lot of difference there. You want to find things out, you want to know what's what, so do investigators. And I have to tell you, when I come to these conferences, the next day I have an IQ about 20 points higher than, than when I came to the conference. It's, it's just wonderful coming here. So now, after 18 years, it's, it's uh, like being with family. And, uh, and I'm glad to be here. We are going to... Thanks, brother. We are going to cover today a less of a tour de horizon than I normally do. For those of you who were here in 2008, 2010, 2006 and a half at the Stevens conference, because as some of you know, my talk in 2006 was, was interrupted, let's say. Um, anybody who's attended my talk at the last few hopes knows that I typically have a privacy victim and a specific investigation that I put up on the screen. And I show you how it's done and how the fact that privacy is dead is used by investigators. Um, we're not going to do that this year, but I do want to, before I forget, I want to thank Casey, Andy Tribaletti, Nick Daly, Ejoy James, Jorge Loco, probably not a real name, and Webdog, definitely not a real name, for volunteering as privacy victims. Unfortunately, they volunteered within the past few days, and I just didn't have sufficient time to do a worthwhile proctology exam on them. So uh, there will be no privacy victim. There will, however, be some actual case studies. For those of you that have attended this talk, the first five minutes are going to be repetitive. For those of you that haven't, let me tell you what this is about. 
because of the changes in surveillance technologies, because of the changes in computing power, because of the changes in database aggregation, most of all because of 9-11, it is now possible, starting with any piece of information, anything, a telephone number, a license plate, an email address, a photograph, any single piece of information, it is possible to grab a string and pull and pull and pull and end up with a person's entire life down to the level of what they think, what they believe, what they do, who their family is, who their friends are, where they were yesterday, where they were the day before, where they are right now, who they hang out with, everything, without leaving your desk. Uh, it's almost, surveillance teams are almost superfluous now. They're not yet, thank God, or I would be eating cat food, but, uh, and please, no cat meme jokes now. <laughs> it is possible from any piece of information to get a name, address, a phone number, a date of birth, a social security number, all of the obvious things and some not obvious things, photos, sexual orientation, race, religion, politics, hobbies, habits, medical history, not a problem. There are massive aggregated medical databases now where you work, what your salary is, your criminal history, all the lawsuits you've been involved in as a plaintiff, a defendant, a witness, real property, everything you've ever purchased and everywhere you've ever gone and everything you've ever done that is in a marketing database. And as we're gonna discuss, this is not because people want to invade your privacy, it's because people want to sell you things. Your information is worth money. Your privacy is not being invaded today by Big Brother, it's being invaded by Big Marketer. And we're gonna talk about that. One of the biggest changes is the ability to track your physical location. I'm, I'm sorry I came in at the tail end of the previous uh, talk. I heard them talking about surveying cell phones with a drone in a wide area. This is something that is done routinely now. I can tell you that everybody that attended an Occupy Wall Street protest and didn't turn their cell phone off or put it, and sometimes even if they did, the identity of that cell phone has been logged and everybody who was at that demonstration, whether they were arrested, not arrested, where their photos were ID'd, whether an informer pointed them out, it's known they were there anyway. This is routine. I can tell you that if you go into any police station right now in the city of New York, the first thing they do is tell you, oh, I'm sorry, you're not allowed to bring a cell phone in there. We'll hold it for you. Not a joke. And by the way, it's a, it's a legitimate investigatory technique. But cell phones are now the little snitch in your pocket. Cell phones tell me where you are, what you do, who you talk to, everybody you associate with. Cell phone tells me intimate details of your life and character, including were you at a demonstration? Did you attend a mosque? Did you demonstrate in front of an abortion clinic? Did you get an abortion? No heckling, please. Oh, I thought we were gonna have to pull his cell phone. <laughs> Today, we are not going to talk about government databases. We're not gonna talk about Big Brother. Frankly, Big Brother is an amateur. I can tell you just on the topic of drones, these people are talking about 4,000 drone hours. I can tell you a year uh, being flown by, by CBP, by Customs and Border Patrol. And by the way, they left out a whole bunch of agencies. Every federal agency is using drones now. Even Environmental Protection Agency is using drones. Private industry is flying 20 drone hours for every governmental drone hour. Everything that the government is doing, private industry is doing better and more extensively. We are going to cover today only open source and only privately held stuff. 
no governmental databases. What we're especially going to cover is the information that you contribute. You know, it's too late for a wake-up call for most of the people in this room because everything there is to know about everyone in this room has already been gathered and indexed and distributed and amalgamated and cross-referenced. But you need to know what's going on. If you are going to give up your information, you should at least be doing it openly, knowingly. Now, when I come and I give these talks uh, to non law enforcement groups, and I typically do a one or two day full session on this topic for law enforcement. And I teach them how to use open source information, how to use marketing databases, how to use proprietary information to do their job better. I am an investigator. I think that there are legitimate reasons for law enforcement and investigators to have access to this stuff. Legitimate reasons, good reasons, reasons to the benefit of everyone in this room. But I'm a little schizophrenic on this issue. On one hand, everyone in this room gives up their name, their address, their social security number, their date of birth, where they go, what they do, where they hang out, their photos. They check in everywhere and they tweet from everywhere and they do Facebook updates from everywhere. And I can do my investigation of you without leaving my office. And, and, and by the way, thank you very much. <laughs> I appreciate it. But on the other hand, I'm an American. And it creeps me out as an American that there is this much information available. So I'm really, I'm really on a knife's edge here. I'm a little schizophrenic about this. Uh, and I decided that the, the most honorable thing to do and the most appropriate thing to do is to not have an opinion when I give this talk. I am not going, and I say this every time I talk at Hope and everywhere else, I am not going to tell you what to think. I am hopefully going to tell you what to think about. And I'm going to give you all the information so you can make up your own mind. Today, we are not going to do the full Monty. We are going to concentrate on these areas here. Google, Facebook, and the colonization of the internet, cell phones, GPS, and tracking, profiling, cameras and drones, and the things related to that, and de-anonymization. Is that me? Hello? All right, that's not good either. How's that? We have liftoff. OK. These are the f That's not working. Is there an AV emergency squad here? Get away from this microphone? Is that better? Ah. Technical support, always there when you need it. Not. <laughs> OK. Um, these are the key areas. Rather than try to cover everything, which for those of you who were here last year know, caused me to run into a fourth hour and a guy with a big hook pull me off the stage. Today, what we're going to do is we are actually going to do this within the allotted time. I'm going to leave enough time to take a few questions. By the way, this year, no t-shirts. I'm giving away covert surveillance devices to the people who ask good questions. It just seems a little more fitting. And believe it or not, as an example of where technology is, these are actually cheaper than t-shirts now. No, no fooling. No fooling. Uh, these were, I think, uh, these are pretty good ones. They'll record for two hours, little mini chip, full video and audio. and. Uh, they cost about $13 on eBay, which is cheaper than a good printed Hanes t-shirt. Frightening. So we're going to cover these things, and I'm going to, god damn it. OK, how about? Just use this mic. the wired mic? Yeah, the problem. Would you like to walk around? Yes. Yes, I get antsy. I like to walk around. Is this mic working? Can you hear me now? God damn it. All right, who's screwing with my AV? I don't know. We're getting some wicked interference. Uh, 
I, this is making me very suspicious. <laughs> yeah, well, you're welcome to. In fact, I'll give you my card. Save, save yourself the trouble. Just call me. I'll tell you where I am. Um, we, can, if we can carpool. Uh, I actually, I actually, I just want you to know this is actually true. Two days before the FBI came in here and interrupted my talk in 2006, which is probably the best thing that ever happened to me. If I could get arrested by the FBI every five or six years, I'd be a billionaire. I mean, the publicity I got from that and the trouble they got into was, was amazing. Um, but two days before, they were just painfully inept at following me. And I actually did walk over to this guy who was following me and I said, look, we can ride together. The guy rolled up the window and drove off. And, <laughs> no, it's, and, and by the way, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that I, I'm, I actually felt like a jerk afterwards. I mean, these guys are my, are my colleagues for better or worse. So I kind of, I kind of felt bad. Um, and I regularly work with, with federal agencies, but it was just, I guess, so insulting to them that two days later they came in here and <laughs> there was a hole in the hope schedule. Um, so, uh, okay, back to the serious stuff. I am going to go through this like a speed freak for about two and a half hours. Uh, we are going to cover these primary topics. We're going to leave some time for Q&A. I have here with me today Bruce Sackman, who is the director of the Society of Professional Investigators, who is a remarkable expert in his own right on all things detective related. And he's going to help me with the Q&A. And then Bruce and I are going to go, uh, I'm not sure where. Somebody should probably tell me. Down to the sixth floor somewhere where they've given us a room. And we've got an hour to do anything that anybody wants, talk to you privately answer questions, you can come and play with my databases, whatever you want. So, onward and upward. Here is how it used to be. Back in the Stone Age, you would have a phone number, and then you would get a name and address, and then a date of birth and a social security number, and then addresses, family, POE, business, corporations, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. Each would be a separate step until finally you had, and by the way, this was considered at one time a pretty darn good BI, background investigation. This is now a starting point, and you don't need to do this. Today, you immediately take a phone number and you get a comprehensive report. All of this is cross-referenced, all of this is linked. Every private investigator, every bail recovery agent, every security expert, every law enforcement officer can plug in any one piece of data and immediately it sucks in all the cross-reference data. The problem is sometimes it's not accurate, but that's another story. So here's what's changed in the past 15 years. First of all, computing power and speed. I can now run out of my office and do run out of my office a network that is faster, more powerful, bigger database, does more than what the FBI had 20 years ago. And that's literally true. Storage costs dropping to zero. You can go to Office Max and get a three terabyte drive, a three terabyte drive for 169 bucks. When I started out as an investigator, private investigator, I had a 128K floppy drive in a Mac. Three terabyte drive, $169 beyond anybody's wildest imagination. Uh, uh, imagination. Very important, everything, does this actually work? Yeah, not well. Um, everything is now digital from point of origin. You don't have to key things in, you don't have to scan things in. Everything is digital from the get-go. You charge something on a credit card, it's immediately in a database. You make a telephone, You've got to be kidding. Next cell phone, I'll show you a few tricks. <laughs> everything is cross-referenced. Everything is digital from the get-go. OCR, even old documents, they can take a sheet-feeding scanner. I have in my office called, something called a Fujitsu ScanSnap. 
I take 100 pieces of double-sided paper, put it in there, press a button, walk away. It scans it in, it OCRs it, machine readable, indexes it. I come back, I put it in the shredder. It's as if it was originally typed into the computer. Everything gets sucked in now. Routine cross-referencing. There's a conspiracy here. <laughs> oh, okay. They're preparing for the drones. I mean, this is a perfect example. This is an ad that I found. This is the hard disk you've been waiting for. 10 meg for $3,400. This used to be the routine. Now, big data. Everything is in a database. So the big issue is, how do you manage it? And by the way, this is an enormous problem for the government. Every time there's a terrorist attack or every time there's an incident, the US government goes and they see that they had advanced knowledge of it. They had communications discussing it. They had the players in the conspiracy recorded or surveilled or, or in a database somewhere. The problem was there's so much stuff they can't get to it. If, if, if the government tried to index everything and analyze everything, they would need tens of thousands, literally, of more analysts. That's a big problem. So now you're seeing enormous advances in processing big data where whereas 100 data sets went into something 10 years ago, now you have a million data sets going in. I can tell you that the, that, that the, the Department of Homeland Security informed Congress that they save every year 2.4 trillion trillion events. 2.4 trillion trillion events. And that's just Department of Homeland Security. You have things now like poor man supercomputers running off of Hadoop, running off of everything else, where the processing power is amazing. Now, cell phones. We're going to talk a lot about cell phones, but cell phones are the big game changer. Cell phones are more important than anything else. Cell phones allow me to look into your life, into your activities, second by second. There are creating the, the, the private industry, for strictly commercial purposes, although it's used by government, are creating new searching and indexing techniques, photo analysis, facial recognition, license plate readers, which we're going to talk about, video to text. I can take a video, feed it in, and it will send me a text saying, car drove down the street, made a left, here's the license plate, without me ever watching that video. It'll tell me there's a meeting, there's a fight, there's a romantic encounter. All of these are things that computers can now recognize. Cameras. Cameras are a big, big, big deal. I can tell you that it is possible for me now to take a picture. Oh, that reminds me. Hold on. I should be filming. I should be filming you all. You're filming me, so now I'm filming you. Okay. I'm, by the way, I'm not kidding. If you, if you uh, donated 75 bucks to the uh, Hope WBAI fundraiser, you got one of these. This is the one that's left over, so I figured I'd play with it. Um, I can take a picture right now, boom, take a picture of this room, darkness doesn't matter, focus doesn't matter, distance doesn't matter. There are cameras that have sufficient pixels, sufficient sensitivity, and sufficient ways of taking photos where it'll take a photo that's across the entire focusing spectrum, across the entire exposure spectrum, that I can, after the fact, a year from now, refocus the photo, reshoot the photo, essentially, and pick out a guy in the back, run him through a facial recognition program, and have his name. You'll see that actually being done. Precision target marketing. Most of this comes down to people want to sell you stuff. They want to take the right item and shove it at the right people who are really interested in it. So they want to know everything about you. And some of the stuff that they are able to extrapolate out is just amazing. The thing you need to keep in mind during this talk and in general, the data being gathered about you is not, for most of you, 
is not because somebody thinks you're a terrorist or a miscreant or a bad guy. It's not because of a security issue. It's not, and, and I hate this phrase because it's always bullshit when they say it's for your convenience. These three things are never true. It's because people want to make money off your eyeballs and your credit card and your email and so on and so forth. Finally, nothing is ever thrown away. Now, when I went to college, I was, I was a chemistry student. I wanted to be a doctor. I was actually, God help me, in a pre-med program. And, and every chemistry course I took, they would say, this is so-and-so's law, this is this and that law, so-and-so's theorem. I've decided I am going to name some laws. So today you're going to hear about Rambam's first law, Rambam's second law. But here we have Hoover's law. Nothing is ever thrown away. There is no forgetting. Nothing ever disappears. Every photo, every drunken post, every horrible Facebook post that you make. And by the way, I don't know if you heard about this, but last week, new change in how Facebook does business. You can, there's good news and there's bad news, as there always is with Facebook. And the, the, the balance is always you're getting screwed by Zuckerberg. <laughs> but no, you'll see. The good news is you can go in and edit comments now after the time is up. If you say, did you see that girl with Bob? She was so fat. You could go and say, did you see that girl with Bob? What a sweetheart. More of her to love. <laughs> but anybody can click on all your changes now. Not only can you change it, but the new comment and the change is in there. Now, a lot of people, I mean, it's a notorious form of trolling. You put up something, somebody puts in some really crazy comment, you change your original post and they look like a knucklehead. Um, now that can't happen. Your original post will be there. But, but Zuckerberg is so determined to keep everything you do, your, not just your timeline, but the timeline of your comments, that all the previous iterations of the comment are in there. But, so you get drunk and somebody takes a strange picture, never goes away. <laughs> this is my favorite one. I want to tell you these are real pictures. The one thing that I've been dying to do and everybody asks me to do is run facial recognition on this guy. I don't have the heart. I don't have the heart. It is so easy to archive every damn thing that even private industry does it. You all are familiar with archive.org. They take every web page every week, grab every web page, put it in there. By the way, investigator's best friend. Investigator's best friend. The biggest change, the biggest, 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 biggest change is personal attitudes towards privacy. I can tell you, I don't want to sound like an old guy. I don't want to say, you know, when I was your age, I had to walk 10 miles through the snow with, a, with an acoustic coupler to an untapped tel cell, you know, pay phone to do my hacking, you know? Um, I, I'm not that old a guy. But I have to tell you that when I grew up, there was an expression, damn, I wouldn't have told that. That expression has disappeared. There is nothing that people don't tell. Nothing. Nothing. And the question is, why? Now, a buddy of mine told me that he heard a speech by uh, Corey Doctorow from uh, Bada Bing Bada Boing, whatever is the website is called. Uh, Boing Boing. In Brooklyn, it's bada bing, bada boing. <laughs> boing Boing, right, boingboing.org. And Corey Doctorow said something very, very smart. You don't realize the beginning and the end. It's like smoking. Nobody would smoke if after their first cigarette, they got throat cancer. Nobody would smoke. The, 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 the negative consequences are so far in the future, it just doesn't register in your consciousness. It's the same thing with all of this moronic sharing of your data, all this checking in and tweeting and Facebooking and all this other crap that you young kids do on the interwebs, you know? The, not to make a joke, but 
Every single one of these, these things that you do goes into your permanent record. It never disappears, it gets indexed, it's there. You may say, I only gave these guys my date of birth. I only gave these guys the first five numbers of my social security number. These guys I gave the last four digits. These guys I gave my home address. These guys have my photo. These guys know my friends. These guys know my sexual preference. These guys are the ones I buy my trips from. These are the guys I download music from. Here's who I get my eBooks from. Excuse me, I don't mean to be rude, but you're morons. <laughs> I say that with love because what you don't realize is all of this is in one place. It doesn't stay in one place. It goes together. People buy it up, people borrow it. I can tell you that law enforcement and investigators and marketers are crawling every damn Facebook page they can, every MySpace page they can, every Twitter feed they can. And by the way, they don't even have to crawl Twitter. Six years of Twitter have just been given to the Library of Congress. It's public record. I can go and file a FOIA request with the Library of Congress and get six years of tweets. God, God help me, I don't want it, I don't care about people's cats and where they had lunch and whatever, but it's public record. Everybody's tweet, everybody's tweet. It's all in one place. And by the way, one reason why I love you guys, really do love you guys, is when I put this up in 2008 and spoke about Twitter and spoke about what a danger Twitter is, Everybody tweeted about it. It was the sickest thing ever. I mean, you people are perverse. You really are. But look at this guy. Just got out of work. No, starting from the bottom. Roaming the streets with, if I'm an investigator and I'm checking you out, I know everywhere you are every minute of the day. 13 hours ago, roaming the streets and I know everybody who you were with. These, believe me, these are my subpoena targets. Watching Malibu's Most Wanted. Then, holy effing crap, I got my bumpers to glow to the max. I mean, honest to God, who cares? <laughs> Just woke up, listening to XM radio, ready for work, going to Avacoli's for pizza, at work. Just got out of work. How much surveillance do I need to do on this guy? <laughs> there was a great site. The guy brought this site down, not because it worked, but because he gave up. Nobody paid attention. He had a site called I Can Stalk You. He took people's tweets and he sucked out their location data and he sucked out their information and he would send them emails. Hey, moron, I know where you are. Nobody cared, they just kept tweeting. It's a whole change in attitude. Okay, idiots. My voicemail password at work and the end of my zip code about 613. Why, why, tell me why. Okay, escape from the cops twice during Hurricane Irene. <laughs> Listen, these are for real. This is not Photoshop. My, my word as a maniac, these are true. This one's not funny, not at all. Anybody laughs, I kick your ass, and I'm not kidding. London riots, ha ha, dude, what a rush. Laughing my ass off. I've never stabbed a cop before. He said, please don't, I have a daughter. Should have seen the look on his face. Never thought you'd get stabbed by a hot blonde chick, huff faggot cop. First of all, I hope she dies in hell. But besides that, yes. This is the funniest one. I'll just let you read it. You know, you know what, for the people in the back who can't see this because I see people squinting, off to the Toronto Film Festival. Haven't been through customs in a long time. Hope meth is no longer an issue. <laughs> Holy moly. This is, by the way, this is for real. Do you know Alex Rogan? Yes, of course. He's a comedian. He's a comedian. I guarantee you he got the rubber glove treatment anyway. <laughs> Even if it's a joke. Oh, man. Yeah, TSA is known for their sense of humor, right? <laughs> and, and by the way, Twitter doesn't just put the analog statement up there. These are all the data points, where you are, what you're doing, what machine you're using, your phone, everything. From one tweet, I own you, Facebook. Okay. Again, God, why? 
Why? 35% of the English-speaking world. 35%. The average user spends an hour a day. I can't find an hour in my day to go to the bathroom. I mean, an hour a day. <laughs> this is who you're giving your information to. You feel good about that? If this, if this doesn't tell you enough, read this. When he was deposed in the famous, the famous trial that the social network movie was about, this is one of the chats that they found. <laughs> I have over 4,000 emails, this is Zuckerberg. I have over 4,000 emails, pictures, and addresses. As, that's probably should be SMSs, it's a ty typo. And his friend says, what? How'd you manage that? Back then, 4,000 people's info was like huge. How'd you manage that, dude? He says, People just submitted it. I don't know why. They trust me, dumb fucks. <laughs> yes. One in seven minutes sent, spent online and one in three minutes spent on social networking sites or Facebook. Facebook subscribers must, and they do, put in their real addresses, ages, email addresses, names, hobbies, tastes, interests, and they link to their real friends. And I gotta tell you, Knowing about your friends is important. If I know who your friends are and what they like, I can extrapolate to who you are and what you do and what you like. Again, bada bing, bada boom. Facebook is very, very clever. They have walled off their section of the internet. If you want to read a Microsoft document, you got to use their plugin. You want to look at a picture? You can't export a picture to somebody. Somebody has to log on to your Facebook page to look at that picture. Or you have to share it with them. You can go into Facebook. They put like buttons and open graph on every damn web page out there so they can suck down your likes and dislikes, but they don't share outward. They colonize the web. Now, Zuckerberg is upfront about it. All of these guys are upfront about it. That's the one thing I got to give them. We think it's important, an important next step to tell the story of your life. Hey, they have the entire story of your life, minute by minute by minute by minute. It's called timeline. Open graph sucks things in from all the web pages out there. I don't understand the concept of like. I'm reading an article on the New York Times and I'm gonna take time to tell Zuckerberg I dig this article? I'm gonna take time to tell my friends through Facebook? I mean, I'll have a beer with my friends. I'll tell them, hey, did you see this article? And by the way, because I'm an analog kind of guy, I'll probably have the New York Times in my hand. <laughs> Facebook through apps is gathering every bit of information about you and about your friends. Here's something you need to know, and, and, and anybody who doesn't get it, raise their hand and I'll say it again. If you have somebody that you have friended on Facebook and that person has an app that they are using, it gives that app your information too. Not only are you snitching on yourself, every single one of your friends has given up all your information and your photos through facial recognition and everything else. Now, by the way, it's not enough that Facebook now has 950 million subscribers. Almost a billion subscribers. I mean, I should do the little pinky thing. One billion subscribers. They are going out through your address book and through your phone book. And by the way, if you haven't been noticing, all your addresses on Facebook are now being changed to moron at facebook.com. And, and all of the, for a lot of people, even in their phone, their addresses are being changed if the people are being identified as Facebook subscribers. Everything is harvested into Facebook. Facebook is building shadow profiles of all of your friends, even if they're not on Facebook or you haven't liked them. Now, there's a lawsuit under the EU laws, the privacy laws in Europe, which are much, much tougher than here against Facebook. And here's what it's been determined that they're doing shadow profiles, tagging, synchronizing, deleted postings, they still keep them. Uh, postings on other users' pages, messages, deleted messages, they keep them. Privacy policy, ignored. Facial recognition, mastered. D 
deleted friends, they keep deleted friends. By the way, everything you delete off of Facebook, you can't see it, Zuckerberg can, for at least three years. This is, I put this up because this is a hilarious story. This guy, this guy is on the internet and he sees a 55 gallon jug of KY. Okay, that's maybe not for you, but for me, that's more than one lifetime. I would have to be a Buddhist and be reincarnated to use 55 gallons of KY. And not how you're thinking, by the way. This guy thought it was funny. So he hit the like button and he said, uh, for Valentine's Day and every day for the rest of your life. Okay, well, see, this guy, like everybody else, didn't read Facebook's terms of service. So he didn't realize that he is now an ad. They took his picture, they put it next to the social lubricant, and they said, this guy likes this. <laughs> Technically, true. A couple of weeks ago, Facebook settled a lawsuit. They gave the EFF $10 million. And by the way, A, congratulations, EFF. And B, I know where you can hire a good investigator with that $10 million. Um, <laughs> they settled this lawsuit. They gave the EFF a bunch of money, which the EFF very much deserves. Um, but it's a meaningless settlement. They changed the way the like button is used. They just moved it over. <laughs> and it's just like, by the way, they're just like the US government in that respect, how the US government can't use bumper beepers for GPS, so they just use the GPS on your cell phone, which, by the way, is 50 times better. You put a bumper beeper on a car, all you know is where the car is. You follow a guy's cell phone, you know where he is, which is the idea in the first place. So, oh, and here's the app thing. People on Facebook who can see your info can bring it with them. Now, this was a spe that's very interesting to me, and it includes your bio, your birthday, your family, your relationship, your website, if you're online, so on and so forth. I didn't know that Facebook also included what you're interested in and your religious and political views. Just good to know what your friends are sharing and giving to complete strangers. Many of you don't care. It's a change in attitude. Now, Facebook, you all know face.com, phenomenal facial, facial recognition program. They really, really mastered it. Well, Facebook bought it, and they're using it to run every single photo. Photo recognition, facial recognition of every single photo. Why? Why, you may ask, did they buy Facebook? Let me just... This is Facebook. This little dot is the entire Library of Congress. That little dot in the corner is the Library of Congress. That gigantic square is Facebook photos. You know, infographics are great. When I saw this, my head exploded. Just like Twitter, people don't get it. Here's a guy who confesses to a rape on Facebook. Here's a guy who says, I'm on the run for robbing a bank. And he puts up, and by the way, he puts up photos. Unfortunately, this is one of my fellow Crooklyn residents, and I'm sorry about that, but I'm happy to say he's locked up. Um, this is a guy, I don't know if you can read that, this is not a joke. Everything I put up, serious. No jokes, no Photoshop. This is what happens when my baby hits me back. Uh, bad man, thanks to photo recognition, bad man in jail. But nevertheless, it's amazing. Now, just like I can stalk you, there's something called we know what you're doing. And these guys go in and they grab people who say, I hate my boss so effing much. The film Horrible Bosses is making more and more sense to me. Yeah, that's a good job advancement move. Phone number, to those of you people who, who, who have my number, so-and-so, that number is no longer any good. Here's a new phone number, here's a new phone number, here's a new phone number. This guy actually started calling these people up and saying, hey, knucklehead, didn't matter. Who's taking drugs? <laughs> Let's smoke weed and get high, because life is short. Yeah, so is your freedom. Uh, who's hungover? 
not sure if I'm ruthlessly hungover or if I'm sick. Well, how about both? And an idiom. Now, by the way, oh, okay. Well, we're going to flip through this, but I, I usually point out to the investigators, you better check this information because all your clients do. Um, oh, this cracks me up. About three months ago, employers started a practice, or it became known that employees were asking for people's Facebook passwords so they could look at the Facebook profile and decide if they were employment material. So Facebook, because they're so concerned about your privacy, said, as a user, you shouldn't be forced to share your private information and communications. As the friend of a user, you shouldn't have to worry that your information or communications will be revealed. Yeah, you know, how about that? And again, why? Why are people doing this? And I tell you, it's a really insidious thing. In addition to not realizing the cumulative effect, it's because your friends are there and you post something and you're like a masturbating monkey. You keep throwing things up there until you get the response you're looking for. And you keep posting. And then finally somebody says, yeah, good post, like, and your day is fulfilled. Get a life. Please, God, get a life. Why? I mean, if you think about this in the abstract, if I came to you and I, if I came to you 10 years ago and I said, a day will come when you will spend one to five hours in front of a computer talking to your friends, not face to face, but sending them stuff online about what you had for pizza and, and what book you read and whatever, without ever leaving your bedroom, hoping for a response, you would say, <laughs> what are you, insane? Well, think about it objectively. Now, as an investigator, I've got to tell you that who your friends are and what your friends do and where your friends go and the people around you tells me an enormous, enormous amount. That is the value of friends and association and Twitter followers and all of that. The first thing I do as an investigator is suck down your friends list before you're smart enough to realize I'm going after it. Suck down your Twitter feed. Suck down, thank God, Twitter, you can't conceal who you're following and who your followers are. Tells me everything I need to know. Let's face it, if you have 47 info security guys and three dominatrixes. As your Twitter friends, you're an info security guy who likes to be spanked. It's that simple. It really is. Who your friends are tell me everything about you. And the fact of the matter is, even who you marry, there's a whole study of it, which is, which is amazing. God, for, God forgive me for using this phrase, but Google a sort of mating. It's fascinating, it's fascinating. One school sucked down all the um, Facebook profiles at the school, determined who had gay friends, who had a certain type of gay friends, and with a 93% degree of accuracy, they were able to figure out who was gay. Now, I gotta tell you, I've seen some of these pa people's Facebook pages, and. Trust me, I could figure that out without, you know, guys where I come from don't dress like that. Anyway, by the way, I, I want to add one thing very, very seriously. Um, I talk a lot about religious differences in these seminars and whether somebody's gay or not gay or black or white or Democrat or Republican. Um, I don't care. I, honest to God, don't care. There's probably 100 people in this room who know me personally, 50 that are my friends. Uh, so you know that I really don't care. I definitely don't care about gay people or gay marriage. I mean, I think they have a right to be as miserable as straight people if they want. Um, I, I don't care. I don't care. But other people care, and that's why I mention it. I mention that when you put out there, if you're gay or straight or black or white or Jewish or Gentile or Democrat or Republican, people care. There's knuckleheads. There's an endless amount of knuckleheads out there. If there wasn't an endless amount of knuckleheads, I'd be out of a job. So I'm telling you that people care. And you need to decide, do you want to share that personal information? So Project Gaydar figured that out. 
Just so you know, Facebook, as of 90 days ago, now monitors your Facebook chats for criminal activity. Very nice of them. I like it. You may want more privacy. Again, <laughs> do you want this guy to have your information? And do you care that this is how he feels? And on top of that, Facebook is now going to offer banking. <laughs> the first national bank of Zuckerberg. Okay, my, MySpace. MySpace, sad site, stupid site. Most of you are on it because you forgot your passports and your passwords and you can't figure, figure out how to take your damn page down. But nevertheless, Facebook is great. And Facebook is the ghetto of the internet. Face, that's what I meant. MySpace is the ghetto of the internet. MySpace makes 4chan look like a gathering of Nobel Prize winners. <laughs> it really does. It really does. Um, people put the craziest shit up on MySpace. And, and you know, it's true. And I mean, drug use and psychological conflicts and whatever. This is, you know, the rare occasions when I go to synagogue, I thank God for my health, I thank God for my family, I thank God for my friends, I thank God for my space. It's unbelievable. <laughs> this is a real page. Now I concealed her face, not because I don't have a legal right to put this up there, but because I feel sorry for her. She's a moron. Can, can you guys read this? Amazing. Okay, here's a guy smoking pot. Here's a guy with a big stash of pot. Uh, I'm looking for a real easy arrest so I can get that promotion I've been working for. Ta-da! You know, not somebody I'm sending a Hanukkah card, right? Here's Ganja Girl. Uh, she's bisexual, she likes getting high, and she works at the pizza factory if you guys are interested. I mean, too much information! Kind of hot photo, but too much information. Captain Cooth. <laughs> Folks, I've got your next babysitter for you. <laughs> I mean, come on. Now, this is a true story. I spoke at Cal, I spoke at Cal Polytech. I, I gave a full day to the, to the IT security people there. Completely different talk than I'm giving here, believe me. And I was told by the, the, the head geek there, listen, don't speak abstractly. Find some stuff related to to local people. So I found that there's a club of people who like smoking pot, go to Cal, Poly Pomona, and get together. And I put this up on the screen as an example. Well, campus police were in the back taking notes. All of these people, no longer students. Sorry, I didn't know they were in the back, but they're morons, so not on me. Some of it's not funny. Here's a woman who lost her baby because her dad beat her up so badly, she miscarried. She put this up on her webpage. Here's somebody, I just wanna read this to you. She was so beautiful, I hated it. She walked outside that night to smoke, I followed her. I wanted to get her alone. After about five minutes of being alone with her, I walked up behind her and knocked her in the head with a rock. After she was out, I dragged her by her hair into the ditch and stripped her clothes off. Now, I don't know if this is fantasy or real, but again, People don't have a real good sense of humor about this sort of thing, and appropriately so. Here's somebody talking about, okay, when I was 13, I was raped by a 16-year-old. Here's somebody I was sexually abused, raped as a young girl, sexually abused by most of my life. Trust me, all of these people can be traced back to their original people and victimized, and victimized. Not smart. Why? I don't know. Too much information. Blippy. I don't understand Blippy. Who cares what you bought and how much you paid for it and whether you like it or not? Now, by the way, because God strikes idiots, this thing about God protects fools and children, bullshit. God doesn't protect fools. You get what you deserve and these people got what they deserve. Blippi put up their full credit card numbers, which I've, which I've uh, whatever. Oh, and, and their addresses and everything. Um, Swipely, same thing. Who cares? Honestly. Couple of final examples before we get into the crazy stuff. Um, if you plug your iPhone into this 
Wi-Fi connected base from iHome. iHome makes great products. This is one of the more moronic ones, which by the way is selling like gangbusters. You plug in your phone and it immediately notifies on your Facebook feed and on your Twitter feed, uh, Dolores is asleep. <laughs> See, back when I was hanging with Fred Flintstone in the old days, if I called somebody and they didn't answer their phone, I would say, okay, I guess he's asleep. I didn't have to look on their freaking Twitter feed. Too much information. Okay. Okay, you know, there really, there really is an app for that. Guys? Ladies, ladies on the receiving end of this post, too much information. I just made love. Well, if I want to make love a second time, I'm probably not going to use this app. But I mean, but lots and lots and lots and lots of people. Honest to God, I'm a smart guy. I have a high IQ. I'm about to get an advanced degree. I have board certifications. I'm definitely much smarter than I look. I don't get this at all, beyond my ability. You want to brag? Do what I used to do. Go to the parking lot behind the 7-Eleven, have your friend hand you a beer and say, man, you won't believe what I did last night. I mean, come on. Now, I wanted to end with the most moronic, craziest example of the death of privacy. This is why, ladies and gentlemen, this talk is not called Privacy is Dead. This is called Privacy, a postmortem. It is never coming back to life. They have hammered a stake in its heart. It will never come back to life. PMS buddy. Gee, what do you think that person is announcing? exactly what you think. Hey, I'm having PMS right now. My God. Now, by the way, if, if the concept of that isn't enough, now integrated with your Facebook page. Uh, if you think I'm making this up, I mean, come on, go, go right to the net. See if I'm making this crap up. Have I made my point? Now let's move on to the stuff that is against your will. All of that is your stupidity, which primes the pump. Now let's talk about people that make Zuckerberg look like a frickin' amateur. We are talking about Beavis and Butthead, <laughs> Sergey and Larry, the owners of Google. When I was a kid, I was an activist for Soviet Jews. And I got Sergey Brin's dad out of Russia. His son was born here and created Google. I will be doing penance for the rest of my life. <laughs> Anatoly Sharansky, cool. Sergey Brin, maybe not. <laughs> you have no idea how big Google is. Last year, at one point, they had more cash on hand than the US government. That's actually true. They have, on staff, 600 PhDs. They have a half a million servers, and that's growing. By the way, they have developed a server aggregation method where they have what's called a server in a box. It's a giant shipping crate with the server in there. They just roll it up on the back of a semi, jack in the cables, and they got a new server online. They need so many servers constantly growing that they actually can truck in a server cluster like every nanosecond, I don't even know. They are Skynet. They are really Skynet. Google is capable of keeping the entire web in RAM. <laughs> you know, if you're not a geek enough to understand that, turn to the left or right and the person next to you <laughs> will explain that, but they are Skynet. They use more power than Salt Lake City 
which, you know, I'm sure Romney will do something about that, but <laughs> see, he's from Salt Lake. It's kind of a Mormon joke, but anyway. Um, you don't need to ask why here, because Google does this all without your permission, but, but you help them along. Gmail, Google, Google Toolbar on your computer, Google Docs, Google Groups, Google Phone, God help you, Google Message Transcription. When you get a text of a voice message that gets sent to you, do you think you're the only person that gets that? And I'm not saying this out of paranoia, I know the answer to that. Google keeps everything. And by the way, I hope I remember to say this later, every time you take your iPhone and you say, Siri, where can I find a showing of so-and-so or give me directions to whatever, Apple buffers that entire exchange in text, in case I forget to mention that later. Every book, every news feed, every map, music, finance, checkout, which is their version of, of, of PayPal. Video, also known as YouTube, of course. Google Telecom. Google is not just Google Voice. Google is considered a telephone company, legally speaking. Frugal, which is Google products. Chrome browser, calendar, contacts, and so on, and so on, and so on. Google keeps track of everything you do, everybody you talk to, everywhere you go, everything you like, everybody you hang out with, everything. Sooner or later, you put it into Google. And most important, they keep track of where you are and what you're doing. And they do that through multiple ways. Google accounts, Gmail, IP number of logins, your location when you authenticate, the syncing of your contacts and calendars, and especially your Android phone. Everybody who has an Android phone, that phone phones back to the mothership. And I gotta tell you, I hate the iPhone, how you have to delete all your contacts and do this and do that, and iTunes sends you the scary message every time you wanna move one freaking MP3, we're about to wipe out your whole freaking phone, and all of these things. Google, a thousand times worse. How do you get, think about this, how do you get your calendars and contacts onto your Android phone? You send it to Google and they give it back to you. How nice of you, Google. You can't just run a USB cable to your computer and put it on your Google phone. You can't even jailbreak a way to do that. At least you can jailbreak an iPhone. Double click. Double click defines down who you are for ads. AdMob, FeedBurner. Actually, AdMob ended up going to the turtleneck, um, Steve Jobs. Docs, spreadsheet, calendar. Google Health. Google is now going to be a health records repository. Your medical history will be held in Google's cloud. God help you. Google would like to add your current location. Everybody says yes. I threw away the phone. No, I really did. I really did. And I got an iPhone because at least there you can have global location services turned off. Everywhere you go, everything you do, they're watching you. It's a fact. And they have all of these apps. Each of these apps tell you wonderful things and help you do wonderful things, but they tell about you. An app that helps you find a movie tells what movies you like. An app that tells you how to find a restaurant tells what food you like and so on and so on and so on. Google goggles, it's an incredible thing. I can hold up my Android phone, or my iPhone for that matter, because they're colonizing everywhere, take a shot of a building and it will tell me what famous people lived in that building. It'll tell me that I'm looking at the Mona Lisa, that I'm looking at the Eiffel Tower. You know, it will tell me what I'm looking at. It will do visual recognition and tell me. It's an amazing thing, Google goggles but it also tells Google a little bit more about me. A little bit more of my soul is sent to the Google Cloud. And it's just, and by the way, I can't even hide who I am when I'm asking it because it's my cell phone, my cell phone. And the important thing to remember about a cell phone is you don't have a shared cell phone like you have a shared computer. You don't have Tor on your cell phone. You don't have a library where you can go and borrow the cell phone. 
Not if you want a really good smartphone at a really good price. You don't. So every time you use that damn cell phone, they know it's you. Okay, whatever you said, A, I didn't hear it, and B, shut up till the Q&A session. <laughs> Google goggles. Google goggles. Everything that you're looking at. Now, Google tracks you through the normal methods, through GPS and GPSA on your cell phone. It tracks you through cell tower triangulation. That's not enough for Google. A couple of weeks ago, Google patented P2P tracking of cell phones. If there's a problem with tracking Bob, but they know that Joe and Mary and Fred are 40 meters, 30 meters, and 20 meters from the cell phone they can't track, and they know where those three, so, three cell phones are, they know where you are. Google is doing, and again, the amazing thing about Google is they do the obvious shit. It's like, why didn't anybody else do this before? Skyhook was brilliant. Skyhook does things relation, in relation to routers and, and Wi-Fi signals and things like that and cell towers and whatever. And it can pretty well identify where you are even in an urban area within a couple of hundred feet, even without GPS. This is frickin' brilliant. Now, I'm gonna talk about this in a minute. I've talked about this at the last three hopes at least, how there are programs like, like Rabbi and other programs that, that background you by saying, this guy sat at this table with this guy for three hours. This guy went to the movie with this girl for four hours by your cell phone and what cell phone is next to your cell phone and that sort of thing. It's that good now, by the way. Uh, it can tell you went to this demonstration, this abortion clinic, this hospital, this church, this mosque. But this has never been done where other cell phones are ratting out your cell phone. Not only are you ratting yourself out now, but every other cell phone around you is P2P reporting on where you are. And by the way, that cluster, if I am an organization working with the authorities, which Google so is, Google is this generation's Halliburton. Google provides so many services to the federal government and to private law enforcement that it would take me five of these seminars to tell you about it. I mean, you can research it yourself and you'll be horrified. I'm an investigator and I'm not happy with it. If I want to know who attended an Occupy Wall Street demonstration, the cell phones will tell me about the other cell phones and I will have in one big glob a report of who is at Occupy Wall Street. So then I eliminate out the reporter's phones, I eliminate out the law enforcement phones, I eliminate out phones that only show up for a brief period of time, in other words, somebody walking down a street, and I have every single frickin' demonstrator without sending down a single intelligence agent. This is the new thing, patented, coming soon to invade your privacy. And how many people here read the terms of service? You consent to all of this. Every time you use a Google product, you say, go ahead, screw me. Speech recognition. When Google developed, when Google developed speech recognition, why did they do that? Because they love you? When Google rolled out GOOG411, why did they do that? Because they were upset that you had to pay $1.95 to Verizon to call 411 on your phone? No. They wanted you to go, no, I said Acavoli's pizza. They wanted millions and millions of morons to be constantly giving them feedback on pronunciation and accents and everything else so they could get speech recognition down to a level where they could turn around and sell it. If I have a telephone conversation, here's the big problem. I am, well, I am an investigator. But I am a muckety-muck at the NSA. And I say, gee, President Bush, I, I refuse to say President Obama, gee, President Bush, I've got 50 million Al-Qaeda recordings. There's no way I can listen to them all. There's tons of good intel. What do I do about this? 
da, 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 speech recognition. I take the speech recognition, I boil down to text, and then I just do a simple text search that a trained monkey can do. Search for bomb. That's the purpose of it. It's something that's monetized with your help. You know the 10 million monkeys, they type on a typewriter and sooner or later Shakespeare pops out? Well, 10 million monkeys, us, talking into GOOG 411, and boom, coming out the end is the best speech recognition program that has ever existed on the planet. Just so you know. App Inventor. Google is brilliant. You can't take that away from them. They give you free app development tools that are so simple to use. I mean, it's like HyperCard, for those of you as old as me, HyperCard on steroids. And you can make a program. Here's a guy who would come home and he couldn't fall asleep because he had to text his wife the station before his so she could get in the car and come and pick him up. So he wrote a program that said, Android phone, use my location from the GPS. When I hit that station, send an SMS to my wife saying, arriving in 15 minutes, and ring my phone. He gets on the train, <laughs> falls asleep, hard day at work. His phone reports his whereabout, texts his wife, wakes him up, he gets off the train. Now I gotta say, I, I gotta say, that's really, really cool. Really, really cool. It's actually something useful and helpful and, and gives this poor schmo a chance to sleep. Google gives him the ability to do that, so he's tied even tighter to his Google phone. Can you imagine doing that for your iPhone? To even get it onto your iPhone, to open an app developer account, get it approved, get it put on your iPhone, it's like running a drill bit through your head. I mean, my company has an app called Identity Check for finding people. I gotta tell you, I almost wanted to give up my gun permit because I was afraid to go, you know, to have a gun, I was gonna go shoot these people. Amazing, amazing. I, I mean, I don't know if anybody in here has ever developed, I mean, that's a joke, licensing authority, I don't really mean that. <laughs> but it is a nightmare, a real, real nightmare to be able to put an app that you wrote on your own iPhone. Even for testing, you have to get an app developer account, you have to pay them 99 bucks, you have to do all kinds of BS and to actually distribute it publicly, holy moly, you don't have that problem with Google or the Android store. So, geolocation, APIs. Anybody who wants to build in Google reporting on your location, <laughs> Google says, God bless you. Please, report this person's location. There's Google Television. There's a Google iPad coming out. There's Google Music. There's Google Power and Metering. Now, we're going to talk about the Internet of Things, if I talk even faster, before we close. But you go home, you turn on the air conditioner. You've just told Google, if your phone didn't tell, you just told Google, hey, somebody's home. Yeah, it's really that scary. That's not paranoia. It's simple data. It's one more ping to the Google server. That's it. Google travel. Google news. What you're interested in reading about tells who you are. I read about law enforcement topics. I read about geek stuff. I read about New York City because I'm a fifth generation New Yorker. I read about Israel because I care about Israel. You can look at what I read, figure me out pretty quick. Uh, in two seconds, and we're gonna talk about that by the way. Google News, URL shortener. If you wanna share a web page with somebody because you're really thinking it's important, Google knows that you're really thinking it's important. Now, Bitly, I mean, do you really wanna rely on Libya for your URL shortener? Libya's having some problems, by the way. Google Shopper. Mm. I mean, I, I, I don't even want to go into this. But I do want to tell you, Google Plus allows me to background you in ways you can't imagine. I gave a, a talk at um, 
Alzheimer's, I can't think of the name. Six, six months ago, I gave a talk at a big, I'll probably remember it right at the end of this talk. I gave a talk at a big Texas college in Seguin. So I pulled up all the people with cancer in Seguin. Just that simple. Plus that google.com cancer places live Seguin. Everybody with cancer in Seguin. If I am an HMO and I want to know who has cancer and not telling me, I get everybody in Seguin. Now, here's the problem. Why did I black that guy out? That's a closed profile. This guy is upfront about it, cancer survivor. This guy has a closed web page. He doesn't want anybody to know he has cancer. But I did a Google Plus search. I know that poor schmuck has cancer. It's not my business. Google thinks it is. Google thinks it's their business too. And apparently so does he because he puts it on his Google page. Google wallet, next big thing. NFC, near field communication. And also transmitting from the cell phone. Your financial transactions through Google. Everything you buy. Parking meters. This is being used in Europe already for parking meters. You want a little parking slip to put on your uh, dashboard? You pay for it with your cell phone. You want to buy a Coke from a vending machine? You pay through your cell phone. That's coming to the US and it's going to tell just unbelievable amounts of information about you. Google Project Glass. I spoke about this in 2004. I said, the day is going to come where you're going to have glasses, facial recognition built in. You're going to be at a party. Somebody's going to come up to you and say, hey, Steve, how are you? Your head is going to say, oh, God, who is this? And your glasses are going to say, that's Dolores. Her husband is Bob. You met her on 12, 11, 10. But, you know, a little <laughs> heads up display scrolling past. And you go, Dolores, how's Bob? It's here. Skynet, baby. Skynet. Everything you do, you walk around broadcasting your life. And because Google can decipher voices and index them, can decipher video and index them, already know from who you friended and who's on your Google Plus page and all the other things they suck in, who each person is, they will be able to say, Dolores went to the movies with Bob, saw this movie, they ate popcorn, they went out for pizza afterwards, and then all of a sudden when they got back to her place, the uh, glasses were thrown in a drawer and whatever. Uh, or not. Or not, yeah. <laughs> Uh, see, you're my kind of guy. And, and shut up. Uh, <laughs> facial recognition and videos. They filed a patent for that too. By the way, if you want to know what's coming next, look at patent filings. Go to USPTO.gov, put in Google, put in Apple, put in uh, Facebook, whatever, and you will see what is coming next to Supposedly help you, but in fact, screw you. Google encrypted search, because they love you? Because they want to keep things secret? Eh. Because they're aware of things like form that suck down your activities on a server level? Because they're aware that three weeks ago, Cisco decided that they're going to watch everything that goes through you know, a whole series of Cisco routers? I don't know if you heard about that. Actually, they stopped that. There was such a big uproar. Google is doing this not because they love you, but because they want to be the only guys that have your search information. It's really that simple. By the way, Google even has its own satellite. This is not Photoshop. Skynet. Now, if they don't know you, they do within the first nanosecond that you use Google. Everybody does their own little ego surfing. Show of hands, and I know these are ridiculous questions, but I, I want to make a point. Show of hands, who has Googled themselves? The whole room. Okay. Show of hands, who has Googled their own address? Yeah, I can't really tell, but a bunch of people. Who's Googled their own phone number? Actually, more than address. Okay, tell the truth. Who has Googled their social security number? You big fat liars. <laughs> you people are such liars. People Google everything. They get bored, they Google ex-girlfriends. They Google, huh? Yes, these people, because they're curious. I go, well, okay, fine. Then you're the only smart people on the planet, which, 
which by the way, I'm willing to believe. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Listen, everybody Googles themselves, their address, their phone, their social security number. When I first did this talk on Google in like 2002, 10 years ago, I said, someday I'm going to see somebody's computer, do a forensic analysis, and find out that this guy who's suspected of killing his wife for the insurance money, that in his search history is going to be poisons, divorce lawyers, Aruba, offshore banking, and life insurance. <laughs> and everybody went, ha, 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 got a little polite laugh, and yeah, sure. Well, first case, Justin Barber. Justin Barber dials 911, he's in Florida, he goes, help, help, two black guys burst into my house with guns, they've killed my wife, she's bleeding, they shot me. The cops come, they really think he's a victim. A really, really smart local detective, brings credit to my profession, God bless him, um, goes and seizes the computer because something doesn't feel right to him, and he finds on the computer, six months prior, that they Googled trauma cases, gunshot, right chest. He wanted to know where he could shoot himself to fake a shooting and survive. He's now on death row in Florida. One for the good guys. Here is a more recent case, and this is a damn sad case. Uh, Juliana Mensch, the people that killed her, these two wonderful people, Googled uh, crap. Chemicals to pass out a person, making people faint, way to kill people in their sleep. Interesting Google term. How to suffocate someone and how to poison someone the morning before. They are, well, I don't know what their current status is, but I mean, they're not doing well, thank God. If you really want to judge a company do it the same way you judge a person, by their actions. Now, there's some EFF guys in here, I'm sure. They can do this better than I can because they were involved in a lot of this. But let's talk about some of the obnoxious things that Google have done in which they've very assertively said, screw you, we don't care what you want. Street View, book scans, YouTube, misuse of trademarks, busting safari protections, promoting their own products. If I own Pepsi and I want to take the ad word Coke, Coca-Cola, I can do that and have everybody right at the top of the Google search when they search for Coca-Cola be sent to the Pepsi-Cola site. It's obnoxious and it's nasty and it's wrong. They drive up and down the streets. I mean, there are websites devoted to horrible stuff they've caught, people urinating on their lawn and passed out and fighting and whatever. Everybody's house, everybody's face, I'm sorry, it's wrong. Even private streets, every book, copyright or not. Now, there's a funny story. EFF lawyer, Kevin Bankston, a lot of you have heard of him. He may even be at this conference, I don't know. He hears about Street View. So he goes to Street View, he pulls up his, his, uh, his address, and there he is walking in front of his house. He says, holy crap, he contacts Google and he says, no, you can't use my photo. And they said, yeah, we can. It's the street. No expectation of privacy. By the way, they're right. No expectation of privacy. I take advantage of that all the time, taking pictures of people in public. Here's the problem for Google. He's a lawyer with the EFF. He says, no problem. Be prepared to spend about $20 million in legal fees over the next two years if you don't do something about this. So Google said, you know what? We will blur everybody's face, but only where we figure you're gonna be in Manhattan, which they did, and now people's faces are blurred in Manhattan, and they still screw everybody everywhere else, including possibly here. <laughs> no, this is in the safe zone. Google finds no privacy on private roads. Do not trespass. Google says, nah, they're talking about other people. They go into, this is a Google guy, walks into like Salami Bologna's convenience store, sets up a, a uh, that was not a derogatory comment. I just couldn't think of the guy's name. Um, sets up a camera and starts taking pictures. 
So now, in about a year, Google is going to have millions and millions of interiors. Why? I, I couldn't tell you. I couldn't tell you, but Google wants everything, because they're Skynet. Google's mission is to get everything about everything in their servers. Google is scanning every single book. Copyright, no copyright, they don't care. They don't care. I'm finishing up a book now. I've been sweating over this book and I had to stop it for a while. But I've been sweating over this book for six and a half years. Not a big book, it's gonna be about 400 pages. It's called Stealing Your Own Identity. It's gonna be on this topic, but in much greater obnoxious tinfoil hat detail. Um, including a backstory, a really great backstory involving this guy Rick Dakin and actually a lot about Hope, the 2008 conference and 2006. After I bleed, what? Why are you pointing over there? Uh, not, well, not yet, not yet, not yet. That's actually a really interesting sign. I, I, I want to tell you that we, 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 we are going to be trying some new technical things today, um, which may involve things flying around the room. We were going to have attack drones. And they're not like machine guns or predators. They shoot these Nerf missiles. But they're so freaking cool. They, yeah. And I have uh, Die Valkyrie on my computer. That, and they were going to da I know it's going to be so obnoxious. The lawyer said, you out of your mind. So no attack drones. But a few other things. You know what? Anybody who's going, uh, come backstage, I'll shoot you in the ass with it later, and, and you'll feel fine. But, but I need you to like sign a release and talk to my lawyer on the phone. And We're going to have surveillance, but no attendees will be hurt in the use of these drones or whatever. Not even Groucho here. Um, I wish you guys could see this guy. <laughs> okay, the drone will broadcast you. Um, so anyway, they just suck in every book, regardless of how much the guy bled and whether or not it's copyrighted. Um, they suck in every news story and they regurgitate it on their own news feed with ads. Here you have people going out of business because they can't afford to pay their reporters and they're desperate for subscriptions. Google says, yeah, we don't care New Orleans Times Picayune, or we don't care, Daily News or whatever. We're just gonna suck your story in. Google Street View. Listen, I don't know if you guys have been following this, but Google Street View didn't just have a camera. It had all kinds of sensors, and it was sucking in Wi-Fi transactions and passwords and data and everything, and they admitted it. They admitted it thanks to our the only people on the planet as obnoxious and as dogged as me, the EFF, went and squeezed their little corporate <laughs> private parts and got them to admit it. Eventually, it was forced to reveal that the information it collected could include the full text of emails, sites, visit, and other data. And Google said, totally legal. Eh, wrong, it's violation of the Wiretap Act. It's actually a federal felony. I can tell you that, not as a lawyer, but as an investigator. And this is pretty much what, again, not, not, not photoshopped. This is Google's attitude towards anybody that has the temerity to challenge them. Um, Google, I mean, it's one thing if some little nerd in the back of this room finds a zero day exploit and does his Beavis laugh, you know, <laughs> And, 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 and takes advantage of that zero day exploit and sells it to the people being exploited and goes to Harvard because he now can afford the tuition. It's another thing if Google finds a zero day exploit on Safari and uses it to suck down your history from Safari. Google does this. They're not nice people. We're hackers. They're crackers. They're cyber criminals. It's a fact. I just want to tell you about this because it makes me laugh. Um, 
very, very, I'm having Alzheimer's here again. Eleanor Mills. Eleanor Mills from CNET goes to Google and says, I want to, hey, be quiet back there. Eleanor Mills, when you run a team of investigators, you have the ability to do that. <laughs> Eleanor Mills goes to Google and says, I'd like to interview you about privacy. And Eric Schmidt, who's a mean, mean man, says, yeah, there's no privacy problems, it's all overblown. So she pulls out, and this is way, way back when, when it wasn't as bad as it is now, she pulls out 50 pages of stuff that she got on him from Googling him. And he jumps up, throws her out of the office, bans CNET from Google for a year, and they write this article. So yeah, what's good for the goose is not good for the gander, apparently. Um, so why does Google do this? They do this because they want to sell you stuff. They are the biggest ad company in the world now. They want to know everything about everybody. And by the way, not just Google, but Yahoo and Microsoft and, and, and Apple and everybody else. Apple has its own you know, advertising entity that it sucks data off iPhone. This is never big brother in the forefront of sucking down your data. Despite what all the paranoid knuckleheads that talk at this type of conference tell you, it is not the NSA, it is not the CIA, it is not the FBI. Trust me, I know how the FBI works. If they're after you, you have nothing to fear. Um, <laughs> it is people who have a profit motive. And that is the most ferocious, frightening, effective motivator there is. You're worth money. That's why they grab your crap. Web history. And by the way, there's now a thing called Google addiction among privacy people. If you go to work for a governmental agency, the term for what they have to deal with to keep your communication safe is called Google addiction. They have to wean you away from all of this stuff. You have to set up a whole new persona for secure communications. Now, here's what Eric Schmidt actually said. We can suggest what you should do next, what you care about. Imagine we know where you are, we know what you like. Not only are you never lonely, you're never bored. We suggest what you should be watching because we know what you care about. A near-term future in which you don't forget anything because the computer remembers. You're never lost. If I look at enough of your messaging and your location and use artificial intelligence, we can predict where you're gonna be, which by the way is absolutely true. People are so freaking boring, they go back and forth and back and forth. Same places. You can program it in that if somebody goes somewhere new, it's an anom anomaly and it pops up on a screen. Show us 14 photos of your...